I'm sorry, what was that? Padin? What? We reached 5,000 subscribers, the crowd goes wild! Chill, chill. Even though I'm actually not sure what we do now that we've reached a goal that I've been trying to for ages, thank you and hello. Road to 10k? Guess so. Anyway, let's get to the reason that you guys are here for Bite Size True Crime. Welcome, roll in, roll in. Each week on this teeny tiny channel, we stick 10 minutes on the clock and tell you a brand new story. Now, if you like what I do here, if you like my content, then make sure you're commenting, subscribing us, and helping us to grow because it's the road to 10K, apparently, baby. Last week, I forgot to even add the intro and I forgot to add the clock. So before we go any further, welcome to the anniversary with me, Yinka Bikini. Today we are diving into the life story of a man called Charles Whitman. He was born in June of 1941 and he was 25 when he died this week in 1966, 55 years ago. It isn't often that I throw it all the way back this far, but this story is one that I've wanted to cover for a while. It's one that I've been waiting for. Charles Whitman was an American American mass murderer who became infamous as the Texas Tower Sniper because of the events that we're going to get into today. So let me tell you a little bit about him and his early life. He served as a Marine before enrolling in the University of Texas. He was born in Lake Worth, Florida and at an early age he was taught by his dad to handle guns. Now he was a good student, he was an Eagle Scout, which I hear is like bad boy, and he left home to join the Marines immediately after his 18th birthday in 19. He actually enlisted just a month after graduation. He graduated seventh in his class, so he was super clever. And he hadn't even told his family that he'd enlisted in the army. Now, when asked by a family friend, he told them that he had joined the army because of an incident with his dad. His father had beaten him up and thrown him into the family swimming pool because he had come home drunk one night. And he left home on July the 6th, 1959, having been assigned an 18 month tour of duty with the Marines at Guantanamo Bay. And his father, up until that day, still didn't know he had enlisted. You see, his dad was an abusive man, and he took most of it out on his wife, who did stay with him for years. Charles had two other siblings, but he wanted to escape the family home. Now, during his initial 18 month service between 1959 and 1960, he did pretty well. He earned a sharpshooter's badge and the Marine Corps Expeditionary Medal. He achieved 215 of 250 possible points on marksmanship tests. He did well when shooting rapidly over long distances as well as at moving targets. And after completing his assignment at Guantanamo Bay, he applied to the US Navy to their scholarship program because he wanted to go to college to complete it and become a commissioned officer. Now it may sound like I'm bigging him up and that I'm saying nice things about him, but trust me I'm not. I'm just trying to give you a little overview of what his early life, well what his life was like because he died when he was 25. He earned high scores on the required exam to get into college and the selection committee approved his enrolment at a preparatory school, proprietary? Preparation, proprietary school in Maryland and he completed courses in maths and in physics before being approved to transfer to the Uni of Texas in Austin. Now this is where he met his wife. Kathleen and Charles met in February of 1962 and they only courted for about five months before getting married in August of the same year. Kathleen was Charles's first and his only ever serious girlfriend. He earned a reputation at uni as a practical joker in his years as an engineering student, but his friends also noted some morbid and chilling statements. Statements that would haunt them a little bit later. One of his friends recalled that Charles had said a person could stand off an army from the top of the tower, the tower block they were looking at, before they got him. And he used to say weird things like that all the time. He did though start off as a bad student, but his grades started to get better in the second and third trimester when he was at school. But the Marines considered his grades insufficient for continuation of his scholarship, and he was ordered back to active duty in February of 1963. He went to Camp Lejune, Lejune? Camp Lejune, 
Camp Lejeune, why well, can't I pronounce anything today, in North Carolina for the remainder of his five year enlistment, but he really resented being ordered back into active duty. And while he was there, his sparkling reputation that he had had in the army before just wasn't happening. He got in trouble in for, for gambling while on duty and he um, was actually awaiting trial when he first started keeping diaries. He used to write about his life, he used to write about his job, about his wife, his love for her, and his intentions for her, about keeping her safe. He used to criticize the way the Marine Corps was handling like the trials and stuff that he was going through. And eventually he was honorably discharged from the army and he went back to school, this time studying architecture. Now he got a few jobs to support his wife because that's what you did in the 50s and 60s. And he worked part time in various places. I saw someone that was receptionist but he actually wasn't the amazing supportive diary doting in love besotted husband that he seemed to be on the surface friends said that he admitted to hitting his wife on two occasions they did say oh my gosh like he despised himself for doing it but like what abuser doesn't use that excuse apparently he was so worried that he was becoming his father someone that he resented and someone that abused his mum for years now by 1966 charles Whitman was suffering from severe headaches and he consulted therapists at his uni to discuss concerns that he had over his mental health. I haven't found in-depth records but it just says that he used to call his headaches tremendous and that they used to consume him. And the thing is, I really have been searching for more just on his diagnoses, just on what his mental health was like, because some of those pressures had to have been triggers. They must have for what happens next, but I just couldn't find them. Now, this takes us to July 31st, 1966. Charles went to his mum's house as she had recently left his father after suffering years and years of abuse at his hands. She had left three months earlier and Margaret, who was her name, when she left her husband, Charles drove to Florida and helped her move her stuff all the way to Texas. The two of them were so worried that his father would resort to further violence against Margaret, against his mum, that Charles requested a police assistance to stand outside the house while his mum packed and he got her and his younger siblings and drove them all the way to Texas. So when he rocked up to his mum's house after visiting the store casually and buying a pair of binoculars, a knife and some spam, and he picked up his wife from her summer job. They hung out with a few friends before seeing her off on her evening shift. It seemed like a normal evening. But what actually happened, what exactly happened that evening slash early morning on August the 1st isn't crystal clear. But police officers and investigators alike have deduced that Charles rendered his mum unconscious and he stabbed her in the heart, killing her. He then drove home and did the same to his wife. He stabbed her three times in the heart as she slept, killing her. His motives have never been completely known, but they aren't actually a total mystery because Charles, the diary keeping Charles, left notes. One, he left by his mum's body, which in part read, to whom it may concern, I've just taken my mother's life. I'm very upset over having done it. However, I feel that if there is a heaven, she's definitely there now. I'm truly sorry. And in another note, he requested an autopsy be performed on his remains after he was dead to determine if there was something wrong with him biologically that would be the cause for his actions and his intense headaches. He also wrote that he decided to kill both his mother and his wife. He expressed uncertainty about his reasons, but he said that he didn't believe that his mother had ever enjoyed life as she's entitled to, and that his wife had been as fine a wife to him as any man could have hoped to have had, but he wanted to relieve them of the suffering of this world and save them from the embarrassment of his actions. Now, these notes go on and on and he talks about that he knows it's brutal, that he tried to do a quick job, that if there is an insurance policy, can someone pay his debts off for him, that he wants his dogs to go to the in-laws and to tell them that his wife loved dogs. And he also called his wife's job and said that she was ill and not able to work that day. He called his mum's job and said that she was ill, but the notes never, ever touched on what Charles Whitman did next. It was approximately 11.35 a.m. that he arrived at his uni, the University of Texas on campus. 
He told the security guard that he was a research assistant and there to deliver equipment, and then he climbed to the 28th floor of the UT Tower. He killed the receptionist and three other people on the way up, and then he opened fire from the observation deck with a hunting rifle and with other weapons. The attack took 96 minutes, and altogether he killed 14 people, injuring 31, before he was shot and killed by Austin police officers. Now, most of his victims were shot either in or near the heart, but we don't know why he did it. Now, as you know, he did ask for his brain to be examined and to be checked for signs of mental illness, and this request was granted in the form of a police autopsy, and it did show that he had a brain tumour, but medical experts have never been able to agree over whether or not it had any influence on Whitman's behaviour. Now, investigating officers found that he had visited several physicians in the year before the shootings, but all he was prescribed at the time of his death was Valium. Forensic investigators have theorised that the tumours pressed against his brain related to the anxiety and his fight or flight responses, but I wonder if that's a good enough answer for the amount of people that he killed. 10 minutes on the life of Charles Whitman and of course as always I would love to know what you think. Now this isn't a case that is covered super super heavily uh, on true crime channels and I didn't find many videos on it. All the research that I used is in the description as always so please take advantage of it and have a look and I would like to know what you think. Do you think the brain tumour was the reason that he was capable of such a random and brutal crime especially against those who he claimed to love the most? Most, or do you think there could have been another reason? Uh, drop your comments below. Of course, I'll be back next week with another episode of the anniversary giving you your true crime fix on a Monday. I forgot to say in the intro actually that I run a true crime Instagram, so I'll put the handle here for you and a link in the description for you to have a look. It's just like an on this day of crime, and I upload mini stories in the days, of course, when I'm not doing it here on YouTube. I'll see you next week, and I hope you have a good one. And uh, yeah, cheers to 5K subscribers.